morning and welcome to Christ Central Online. My name is Owen. I get to serve as one of the pastors here. Thank you for joining us this morning. Today is Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. We love you and we appreciate you. And today is also the first Sunday of our phase one as we slowly and cautiously move toward reopening our church for in-person live worship services. Phase one means that we have increased the number of people that we have on site today for worship. Our maximum number now is 30 people so that we can now have our full staff, some essential personnel, and some of our elders in attendance for this worship service. The people who will be here during phase one will be trained and equipped to help our church move into phase two as we prepare and learn new protocols to make sure that our campus is sanitized thoroughly so that when you all return, this place will be as clean and as safe as possible. Now, I know that some of you are very eager to return, but please be patient with us as we do our due diligence to ensure the safety and the health of our church. Well, hear now the call to worship our great God. It comes from Psalm chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, and it says this, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Let's pray together. O God, today we turn our eyes toward you, and we will give you thanks with our whole hearts as we remember all of your wonderful deeds. And the greatest and the most wonderful deed you ever did for us, O God, was to send your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, and then to rise again from the dead for our salvation. And because Jesus was raised from the dead, we know that we who trust in him, we will also be raised from the dead, and that we will forever live with him when he comes again, when he brings the new heaven and the new earth. Today, as sickness and injustice plague our country, we will set our eyes on you, for you will one day come and you will put an end to all sickness and to all injustice and everything will be the way it was supposed to be and we long for that day. But as we wait for you, we will worship you. And today we worship you, our risen, our reigning, and our returning Savior and King. Amen. Central, but wherever you are joining us, let's lift our voices and sing to our King this morning. See Him now, the King of heaven, Son of God, enthroned above. Heavy cross upon His shoulders, carry for us, carry for us. See Him now. King surrender, final word of perfect love. Hear his cry, Father forgive them, spoken for us, spoken for us. When he said it is finished, sing our hope, oh our hope had just begun. The grave has lost its hold. Arise, the stone is gone. Our God reigns forevermore. All praise to Him belong. Lift high His name alone. Jesus paid. name we overcome all our hope in this same power living in us living in us for our sin is defeated oh the war has now been won 
the grave has lost, the grave has lost its hold. Arise, the stone is gone. Our God reigns forevermore. All praise to Him belongs. Lift high His name alone. Jesus. Church, this is our hope this morning that all broken things will come undone. Let's sing this together. Death, lay your weapons down, sin, you're defeated now. The stone is rolled away, our God. together again. Death, lay your weapon down. Death, lay your weapons down. Save your defeated now. The stone is rolled away. Our God, come on, we crown him. We crown him this morning. We give you praise and we give you glory this morning. God, we crown you King and Lord and Savior, the mighty one. God, all praise and honor belongs to you. So, so all throughout service, would you be pleased with what you see? Would you be pleased with what you hear? Would you draw us near to your grace this morning? It's for your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, my friends. I'm so excited that you're here. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. We love you. Uh, I hope all my friends, you get a chance to say that to your dads as well. Give them big hugs, big kisses today. Um, I am here today because um, actually, you know, the one thing I love about Jesus is that he's a great storyteller and he tells stories. And today we're going to actually look into one of his stories. And these stories are called parables. Now, as we talk about this parable, the reason why it's a parable is because Jesus told stories, so it would be easy for us to hear what God says is important for us to hear. So that's what it made it easy when, we, when he told those stories. So today I'm going to tell you a story and a parable of talents. Now, about this story, it's about a man who decides to go on a long journey. So he calls his three servants. He calls his three servants, and then he says to them this, that he's going to give them a talent like this. And these talents are not, actually, they're not just one coin. It's actually, one talent might have been like a bag of gold. Think of it that way. A lot, a lot of money. It's worth a whole bunch of money, okay? But we're going to say this one coin right here is worth one talent, okay? So he says to the first um, servant, he says, I'm going to give you five talents. So let's count this. One, 
two, three, four, five. He says to the second servant, he says, I'm going to give you two talents. One, two. And he says to his third servant, I'm going to give you one talent. <laughs> so then the, the, um, the, the man says, I'm going to go on a long journey, and, but I will return. So he leaves. And while the master is gone, the servant, first servant says, I know what I will do with the five talents my master gave me. I will use it and work hard. So he did. And he doubled the master's money to ten. Then the second servant says, I know what I will do with, my, with the two talents my master gave me. I will use it and work hard. So he did. And he doubled his master's money to four. Now the third servant says, I know what I would do with the one talent my master gave me. I will bury it in the ground. And he hid his master's money instead of working hard and using it to do something good for his master. Now after a long time, the master returns. And he says, well, tell me, what did you do with, with the talents that I gave you? And he goes to the first servant, and the first servant says, I took the five talents, and I doubled it and made it ten. So the, so the master says, okay, let me see. Let's see how many came from the five. It says one, two, three, four, whoops, <laughs> four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Out of the five came ten. So he goes, well done, great servant, faithful servant. You've been given much, now you'll be given more, right? Join in the master's happiness. And then he goes to the second servant and he says, well, what did you do with your two, two talents? And the second servant says, I took your two and I made them four. I doubled it. So let's say the master said, let's see. So he takes the, the two and he says, let's count. One, two, three, four. From the two came four. Well done, faithful servant. Join in your master's happiness. Now, with the third servant, the master goes, well, what did you do with your one? And the third servant says, I got scared, so I wanted to make sure it was safe, and I hid my talent. And you know what the master's response was? It wasn't very nice, because he said, you wicked and lazy servant. I gave it to you so you could use it. If you are given something to use, then you should. If you don't, then it must be taken away from you. So please give it to the servant with the ten. And the servants left. Now what does this tell us about our God today? Because remember, Jesus told these stories so that it helps us see what is important. That God who has something important to tell us. It is this. God has given us much. He has probably given you money, right? In many ways, there's provision for you. Maybe you even get allowances. My kids do, right? Maybe you have something that your, your parents have been blessed. You've been blessed with a home, with food, with clothing, many things. I think for most of us, we can say that we are very blessed and God has given us much. But it is not just in the money or things, but God has also given us in who we are and what you can do. Maybe some of you guys are really good and talented in music, in art. Maybe you guys are organized. Maybe you are good at listening or a good listener. Maybe you are um, a great at sports. Maybe you are a wonderful friend. Maybe you're a cheerful giver. Maybe you are somebody who wants to help and you're a good worker. There are many things that God has made you to be. God has given them to you. And it is, it is this. It's actually God who gave his gifts to you. And he's saying this, just like the master expected his servants to use the talent that he has given, God expects us, with whatever he gives us, to use it for him. But why? Why would we want to do that, right? Why would we want to give and use our gifts? It is this. It is because our master loves us. And our master showed it to us by him giving his everything. He gave us his very best gift. He gave his son Jesus to us. 
And because he's able to do that, because he showed us that, and because we know we have given the reward of his gift, doesn't it make us want to give all that we have back to our master, to bring him joy, to give his, him delight, to do whatever pleases him? Isn't that what we want to do? So this is why, with whatever God has given you, Maybe even today you can talk about it with your families and maybe you can say, hey, I see this gift in you. God has given you this. Maybe dad, encourage your dad today and say, dad, thank you. Maybe with what you can do really well is this and encourage them and then together as a family, why don't you look out for ways that you can use what God has given to bless those who are in need, to help those who are friendless. Maybe you can be a great friend. Maybe for those that right now, you know, are hurting, Maybe there's a way that you guys can come together and use what you have, what blessings God has given to bless others. Let us do this until our master returns. Let us be faithful servants. Amen? Amen. All right, let us all now stand up at, in your homes, and then we're going to end with our Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Church, we're going to continue in our worship with our tithes and offerings. Uh, we give our tithes and offerings because we believe that giving is an act of worship. And it also serves as, as an expression of our love, trust and gratitude to God for all that he's given to us. Now we want to make giving as easy as possible for you. Uh, there on the screen are the three ways that you can give uh, to the church and, and to the Lord. Uh, Christ Central, I just want to thank you for gifts and offerings. At this time, Elder Peter will come and pray for us. Good morning, church, and what a privilege to be here this morning. Um, I get to see the inside of the church. It's been a little while, and it's been a joy to be able to worship here. What a great Father's Day gift to come to the Father's house and worship. Let's pray together. Good and sovereign Father, anoint your beloved church this morning with your spirit so that wherever we are, whomever we are with, and whatever the conditions of our hearts, we may offer up to you wholehearted worship. In the relentless noise and tumult of these days, Holy Spirit, quiet our hearts so that we may still, we may be still and know that you are our, our God and that you still reign. We join with the saints of old in proclaiming, riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Be my inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart, high King of heaven, my treasure thou art. Lord Jesus, you are, the living word, you are the living water, the bread of life, the light of the world, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life. Salvation is found in no other name than the name of Jesus. You are our treasure. We worship you and you alone above all else this morning and by your grace each and every morning. You have been faithful to your church, Christ Central, during this time of trial for our nation and the world. You have provided generously through the generous giving of your people. Our mission to multiply and mature Christ-centered disciples has st steadfastly endured because you have steadfastly loved and sustained us. At the same time, our hearts are broken, and we do weep over the racial injustice that our African-American brothers and sisters in Christ face even today. Where we have been complicit and indifferent Convict us of our sins, so that through the power of your Holy Spirit, godly sorrow would lead to genuine repentance and healing for the church and this nation. As once enemies of God, reconciled by the blood of Christ, may we become agents of reconciliation, bringing healing to both the racist and the one broken by racism, so that the name of Jesus will be glorified high and lifted up. May our church, by humble example, show this great nation a better way, a Christ-exalting way. 
for the enduring work of reconciliation, we lift up our missionaries, Mark and Michelle O, serving as ambassadors at large for Christ among the leaders of this nation and the world. Father, would you continue to bless their ministry, even as they have had to move Bible studies to an online platform? Would you practically provide for their daughter, Deborah, a good job since her internship fell through due to COVID? And help their son, Josiah, complete his um, private pilot's license. Holy Spirit, we continually pray for our gospel partners in the work of expanding and deepening your kingdom here in Washington, D.C. We lift up Reston Bible Church under the leadership of Pastor Mike Minter and Great Commission Community Church under the leadership of Pastor Steve Kim. We pray for these church leaders and their families. Protect them from the evil one. Empower them and sustain them because ministry at times is hard and discouraging work, especially when the people of God are unable to physically fellowship together. We pray for both Pastor Peter and Jane this morning. Father, would they sense through the power of your spirit a growing measure of your presence in their life and the life of their family. As they abide in the vine, would you empower, encourage, and provide endurance for ministry. As Peter preaches your word this morning, may we sense that you are near to us. Finally, Lord Jesus, we eagerly anticipate your return. Come quickly, restore all things. We pray all these things in the name of the King of Ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.
Thank you all for your patience as we're dealing with some technical difficulties. I'm sorry if there's a high ringing pitch, we, we can't fix it, so please bear with us and, and be patient for the rest of the service. Thank you in advance. Um, I just have a few quick announcements I'd like to make uh, before we get to the sermon. Uh, the first announcement regards our Bridges Faith and Work. Uh, this Friday, Christ Central's Faith and Work and Bridges Young Adult Ministries will be hosting a panel discussion on being faithful to Christ in the workplace. Our panelists will talk about their own personal experiences, give advice, and share their lessons learned. And they'll talk specifically about what it means to be faithful in the workplace during COVID-19. Uh, this will be a Zoom event on June 26th, this Friday night, from 7.30 to 9 p.m. You can register on the Planning Center. Also, here's a second announcement. In light of recent events surrounding race and injustice, how can we talk about these tough topics with our young children? How can we as parents help them to see their world through a gospel lens? This Thursday on June 25th, uh, Central Education Ministry will be hosting its first Central Talks Family Edition. It will be a webinar conversation with a panel of Christ Central's families and parents who will be sharing their experiences and discussing how to talk with young children about these very important topics uh, in your home. You can also register for this on the Planning Center. Announcement, th here's a third announcement. The Coalition of Asian American Pastors for DC, a coalition which, uh, to which I belong, is hosting a special evening to listen and to learn from black pastors who live and minister among the black community in DC. It will be an evening where we as Asian American pastors and Asian American churches can listen and learn directly from black church leaders. Pastor T.O. Rogers and Pastor Perrin Rogers are father and son, and they'll be joining us for that evening. Uh, they are amazing men, and I can't wait to learn from them. Uh, they'll be sharing with us what our black brothers and sisters in Christ are going through right now, and they will share their thoughts on how Asian American churches can come alongside and support and encourage the black church and the black community at this time. It will be a very eye-opening, educational, and encouraging time. People have asked, Pastor Owen, what can we do now? Well, the first step is to listen and to learn, and this evening will be an evening to listen and learn. Uh, please plan to join us. This will be on July 2nd, Thursday night at 7.30 p.m. You can also register for this on the Planning Center. And the fourth and last announcement is this. Uh, now that we are in phase one, we will be discontinuing our virtual foyer after the worship service. So for the five of you who've been there every Sunday, we're very sorry, but the virtual foyer will be closed going forward. At this time, I'm going to invite Pastor Peter to come and preach God's word. Good morning. Happy uh, Father's Day to all the dads out there and future dads. Um, I share your joy and uh, sometimes your pain, but uh, mainly joy. <laughs> um, my name is pa uh, Peter, and I serve here as a pastoral intern, and I have the privilege of uh, preaching this morning, and uh, we'll be uh, reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30, as we read about what it means to be waiting and working. Starting from verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of the servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. 
But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest." So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. You know, as a dad, one thing I miss about going to the office every day is coming back home. And for you dads out there, especially of young children, uh, if you're like me, one of your greatest everyday joys is uh, when your children, after waiting all day for you to come home, you finally come home. And uh, it was one of my favorite parts of the day. You know, my kids knew around what time I was supposed to come home, so every day they'd, I'd get a call while I'm, I'm driving on the road, and, and they'd ask, Dad, how far are you? When are you going to be here? How many more minutes? And then as I walk in, they'd run and jump all over me, and it was the best. In the same way, Christians are to eagerly wait for Jesus as he promises to come back. We shouldn't forget or neglect this promise that he'll be back, but we should longingly anticipate that his promise that he will be back. You know, our passage is a parable found in a larger teaching Jesus gave called the Olivet Discourse. And in the Olivet Dis- Discourse, Jesus gives his final teaching to his disciples just before his death. And he tells his disciples what will happen at the very end. He describes the signs of the end of the times. He says, more and more, as it gets closer to the end, there will be more false teachers, more famines, more wars, more earthquakes, more pandemics, more societal unrest, and at the very end of it all, Jesus promises to come back. And then he closes his teaching with a set of parables or stories, and, uh, and the point of the parables is to show what the disciples should be doing as they wait for their Savior to come back. The Bible tells us that if you are a follower of Jesus, you should be waiting for Jesus. But what are we to be doing as we wait? Should we we be tracking the signs of the times? Should we be calculating the day and time of his return? Should we be obsessively praying that he will return? What our passage says is that we need to wait for Jesus by being faithful to Jesus. We need to be faithful to Jesus, and this is the best way to wait for him as we're faithful to him. And so as we look at our parable we're going to see three truths about what it looks like to be faithful. First truth, God resources us to be faithful. He resources us to be faithful. And this is the first thing we see in our story. Verse 16 says that the master gave to one five, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. Our story points us to a couple different ways God resources us by how the master resources his servants. We see that the master resources his servants uniquely. The servants aren't given the same amount of talents. They're all given a different amount. The master gives different amounts to each servant because he knew each servant, and he knew what each servant could manage. What's also interesting is that the master doesn't give any specific instructions to his servants. He doesn't tell them how to invest the money. He doesn't tell them where and what they should be doing to invest. He leaves it completely up to them. He allows them to use their creativity, their ingenuity to invest the talents that they've been giving in their own unique way. But we also see the master resources his servants generously. A talent was ancient Mesopotamian money. And more importantly, a talent was a lot of money, like Director Heidi just uh, told us a little bit ago. In those days, uh, a single talent is what one would have hoped to earn in half a lifetime. So a modern conversion might be that a talent would be around $2 million. So the first servant, five talents, would have gotten $10 million. The second, $4 million. And the last, $2 million. This this isn't chump change. It's a lot of money. The master gives so much money, and he gives them so generously. 
Some of you know that my wife and I at one point were planning to go to Japan as missionaries. And uh, back in 2012, we went through our uh, denomination's uh, mission agency, MTW, their uh, week-long missions assessment. And this is where people who want to go to the mission field, they go and they spend a week where it's essentially like a missionary boot camp. You go through scenarios and situations, they make observations, and at the very end of the week, you sit down with an assessor and they give you uh, a diagnostic report and, uh, and a recommendation. And depending on the recommendation, you may or may not be able to go on the mission field. And so here we are, we're at the very end of the week, so tired, so exhausted, and my wife and I are sitting down uh, one-on-one with our evaluator, our assessor, and he gives us our evaluation. And so he starts with my wife, Jane. He, he begins to effusively praise her, She's charismatic, she's winsome, she's a leader, she's evangelistic. And he went through all her strengths and gifts and how it aligned so well to our potential future ministry. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is amazing. I'm I'm so glad we came. And then he shifts to me. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm leaning in trying to hear what encouragement he's going to lavish on me. And he shows me my report. And he skips through all the good stuff, and he points to a deficiency, my pessimism. And with a dry look, he says, unless you work on this, unless you fix this, you're going to ruin your marriage, and you're going to ruin your ministry. (laughs) And that was my evaluation. (laughs) But let me add, um, him pointing out my, my tendencies, my critical tendencies, really turned out to be one of the biggest blessings of my life. And even though you may not be gifted as a charismatic leader or evangelist, God has gifted every single one of you so uniquely, so generously, and so much more than you think. You know, one way he's gifted you is that he's given you so many natural gifts. Think about your personality. Some of you are helpers. Others of you are achievers. Some of you are collaborators. God gifted you in that way. Or what about your skills and abilities? You know, I'm, I'm speaking to problem solvers and musicians and technologists and teachers and medical health professionals. But he's also gifted you with many of the privileges that you're blessed with. The fact that you were born here and now in America and not 200 years ago in the middle of an Indian slum. The family you're born into, your ethnicity, the education you were provided Because of our privileges, none of us have to worry about where our next meal will come from or even about our own safety. And because of these privileges, all of us have a voice that we can use to be heard. None of these gifts are random. None of these gifts are unimportant. But God not only gives us natural gifts, he gives us spiritual gifts. A couple months ago, we heard a fantastic sermon on on spiritual gifts that God gives. And if you remember, there are a number of spiritual gifts that God gives his church. There's the gift of mercy, the gift of service, the gift of exhortation, hospitality, evangelism, and many more. You know, the fact that we're given different kinds of natural and supernatural spiritual gifts— The fact that God gives gifts at all shows us that God resources us uniquely and generously. All of us are five-talent Christians. We've been given so many resources, so many gifts, so many privileges. And none of these are arbitrary. None of these things are earned. Each and every one is a gift God graciously gives. So as you follow Jesus, it's important to know God has resourced you so that you can be faithful to him. So don't compare or be jealous of other people's gifts. Be thankful for your gifts. But most importantly, use your gifts. And this leads us to the second truth we learn in our parable because we see that God not only resources us to be faithful, but God requires us to be faithful. You know, we're to use our gifts not for ourselves, but for God. Not for ourselves, but for the other. And we know this because after the master resources his servants, we're told that he goes on a very long journey. And while he's away on his journey, his servants are expected to faithfully work for their master. In the same way, God requires us to faithfully work for our Savior. 
there's a couple observations I want to point out from our story on what it looks like to be faithful. First, do take risks. The two faithful servants took risks by investing their master's money. Verse 16 tells us, he would receive the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. And so also the two talents uh, made two talents more. The faithful servants went to work, and they went to work right away. They worked long, they worked hard, and as a result, they doubled their master's money. And one of the main reasons they were able to double their master's money was that they took risks. They invested. And some of you have experience flipping homes or even trading stocks, and you know what investing takes. They put it all on the line. They didn't hold back. And even though they took risks that were probably uh, calculated and measured, they were real. They could have lost everything. But don't miss this. The greatest risk wasn't taken by the servants. It was taken by the master. The master risked his own money by entrusting it to his servants. The master became dependent on the faithfulness of his servants. If his servants lost the money, it would have been the master that would have been financially ruined. But because the master first took a risk on his servants, his servants took a risk for their master. So to be faithful means to take risks for God's kingdom, knowing that the greatest risk was taken by God. Every gift you have, every comfort you enjoy, God has gifted you with those things. So we need to put ourselves out there. We need to put it on the line. We can't be passive or apathetic or lazy. Use your gifts. Use your privileges for the sake of others, for the sake of the gospel, to be faithful to Jesus. If you've been at our church for a while, you may have heard the term relational risk. To be faithful as a, as a Christian means to pursue gospel relationships as you take relational risks. Risks with other unbelievers um, to share the gospel. Risks with other believers to go deeper in the gospel. Risks with the poor and the marginalized oppressed to model the gospel. Taking risks means becoming uncomfortable because kingdom work is work. It's not supposed to be easy. But if your goal in life isn't your comfort, but God's kingdom, you're going to be okay with some discomfort as you take kingdom risks. Second observation on what it looks like to be faithful, don't live for yourself. Unlike the faithful servants who worked hard, the unfaithful servant hardly worked. In fact, he did absolutely nothing. We see that he went about his life as if the master didn't give him any responsibilities at all. And the reason he didn't live for his master was because he didn't love his master. Listen to what he says to his master. He says, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went to hid what was yours. The unfaithful servant's view of the master is the complete opposite of what God is really like. You see, grace is getting what we ourselves don't earn, and God is a gracious God. But the unfaithful servant viewed the master as someone who demands what he himself doesn't earn. He saw the master as a hard man. This is the opposite of grace, and it's the opposite of what God is really like. And this is how the unfaithful servant viewed the master, and so he didn't love his master. And because he didn't love his master, he despised and disregarded his master, and he lived for himself. But to be faithful means to not live for yourself, but for the other. Like many of you, I've, I've never participated in any protests in my entire life. But like some of you, and, and so many all over the world, over the past uh, several weeks, I took part in two of my very first protests. The first one was right here uh, in Centerville, organized by some local uh, college students. And another was in D.C., organized by some Christian ministry leaders and pastors. And as you can guess, both protests were against the brutality and the systemic racism against black lives. And like for many people around the world today, over the past several weeks, I've begun to understand how, 
um, how comprehensive, how, uh, how heavy, how in- unjust, how ugly racism really is. By the way, we had an amazing Central Talks uh, this past uh, Thursday, and if you weren't able to catch it, I highly recommend that you go back and watch. But it's so crazy that it's taken a global pandemic coupled with a global protest for me, like for so many others, to finally wake up to the deep-seated racism against black people. You see it in the economic disparities, you see it in the educational inequities, the criminal justice system, and even our own government policies. I can't imagine being born black and having to wake up every single morning, not only being conscious of the color of my skin, but depending on the time of day, having to worry for the safety of my life, depending on where I am. I can't imagine having to try to have conversations with my kids, the kinds of things I would never, ever talk about with them. Over the past several weeks, it's become so in-your-face evident and so overwhelming, and it's just not fair. There may be some of you still processing everything and trying to figure it out, and trust me, I'm right there with you. On the one hand, From a Christian standpoint, there's a number of controversial and conflicting issues about the Black Lives Organization. But what's the Christian alternative? On the one hand, it makes me so angry to see police brutality against black lives, even in broad daylight. And yet, I know there are so many more upstanding law enforcement officers than corrupt ones. On the one hand, it's hard to deny that our country was built on on the bigotry and on the backs of black lives. And yet, our country's offered so much hope, so much blessings to so many people. There's so many voices, so many things to read, so many layers of complexity, and it can be overwhelming and easier to not just do anything. You know, I know I don't know everything on this issue, but I do know that as a Christian, trying to be faithful, convinced that God is a God who hates injustice, and knowing that our calling is to seek the flourishing of our city, I know I can't just do nothing. So I'm trying to listen. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to grow, trying to use my talent. Our passage reminds us that as Christians, just doing nothing is not an option. Just caring about ourselves is not an option. Just caring about our own families is not an option. Because what we do in this life with our lives matters. And it doesn't just matter momentarily or temporarily. It matters eternally. Whether it's fighting for justice or sharing the gospel or discipling other believers or caring for the poor or serving here at church how we use our resources, and how we carry out our responsibilities as Christians matters a lot. It matters to God, and it should matter to us. You see, as Christians, our primary goal in life isn't to treat earth as if it is heaven, nor is the goal in life to be good enough on earth to go to heaven. But our goal as Christians trying to be faithful is to bring heaven down to earth. That's what faithfully following Jesus looks like. During my seminary, seminary years, um, the great hymn, Joy to the World, radically impacted my view on what it looks like to be faithful as a Christian. You see, the third verse of the hymn says this, No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow as far as a curse is found. You see, faithfully living for Jesus means to work towards the redemption and renewal of the world as far as a curse is found. And what this means is that as Christians, we're to work to meet all kinds of needs caused by the curse of sin. We're going to work to meet spiritual needs, which is why we share the gospel and teach the gospel We're also to work to meet physical needs, which is why we do mercy, which is why we do justice. We work desiring and dreaming that God's blessings would flow as far as a curse is found. That's what it looks like to be faithful. That's what kingdom work looks like. 
So friends, I want to encourage you. Invest your time. Invest your resources. Invest in relationships. Share the gospel. Fight for mercy. Pursue justice. Serve your church. Every day, God has gifted you with opportunities for his blessings to flow through you to a world that desperately needs them, especially as such a time as this is now. So be faithful, because God requires you to be faithful. And lastly, God rewards us for being faithful. We know this because once the master returns, he compensates both the faithful and unfaithful servants. To the unfaithful servant, the master condemns. He calls the unfaithful servant wicked and slothful. He takes away his single talent and he casts him out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And what this means is that for those who don't work for Christ in this life, won't live with Christ in the next life. Now, does this mean that your good works saves you? No. Your good works can never save you. Your, your works aren't that good. You're saved by grace through faith. You don't work for your salvation, but you do work for your Savior. Because saving faith works. Just like you know a tree is an apple tree by the apples it grows, you know a person has true saving faith by their faithful good works. The Bible says if you don't work for Jesus, you probably don't know Jesus. Because if you really knew Jesus, you would love Jesus and you would want to work for Jesus. But if you don't, then on the last day, everything will be taken away. You'll be cast out into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you'll be condemned by God. But the gospel tells us that even for the worst of sinners, even for the most unfaithful amongst us, there is hope. Because what we see is that to the faithful servants, the master commends. He tells them in verse 23, well done, good and faithful servant. He gives them even more than what they already had. The master rewards them. But notice that the reward is disproportionately greater than what they actually deserve. This is grace. He graciously gives them a reward greater than what they deserve, but he also gives them himself. He tells them to enter and share in the master's joy. Friends, this grace is what we ultimately find in the gospel. The gospel tells us that we can enter and we can share in the master's joy, not because of our works, but because of the perfect work of our master. Our story shows us that the only way you can faithfully work for your master to the very end is when you love your master. And in, the, and in the gospel, we find a master that we can more than love because what we find is a master that more than loves us. We have a master who works for us. And on our behalf, our master faithfully worked every single day of his earthly life. And at the end of his life, Instead of getting commended, he was condemned. He gave everything up, had everything taken away. And on the cross, he was cast out from his father, receiving the condemnation that we deserve for our unfaithfulness. And he did it so that we can now enter and share in the joy of our master. He did it so that we can now have him because he loves us. Friends, if you're watching and you're not a Christian, I want to invite you to a personal, real, living relationship with a master who's worked for you far greater than you could ever work for him. To a master who loves you more than anyone could love you. Because if you knew this kind of love, it would change everything. This kind of love gives you the power to be faithful to the very end. This is why we work. We don't work to earn God's love. We work because of God's great love for us. And when we know God's love for us, it makes all the difference in the world. You guys should see a picture now on the screen that uh, my kids drew uh, for me on Father's Day. 
see all the pretty hearts, the, the truck. Uh, on the left, there's a, you can tell uh, vertically, there's a moneymaker sign on the left. That's my oldest son, by the way. The drawing isn't the best drawing there is. Right? It's not even their best drawing. It's a little messy. Um, but to take it further from a purely artistic standpoint, you can't even mention this in the same sentence as like the Mona Lisa or the, or the creation of Adam. But you know, as I see this picture, it's not even close. Because if I had to choose this, uh, if I had to choose between this or the Mona Lisa, I choose this a thousand times. Because as I see this picture, it might as well be a masterpiece. You see, their drawing for me is more than just the drawing. It's their expression of their love for me, which is why it moves me. And so as I see this picture, I, I couldn't be more proud and my heart couldn't be more filled with joy and love for my children. Friends, if you're anything like me, uh, just like many of my children's drawings, your faithfulness is nowhere near perfect. It's actually messy. It's sloppy. It's inconsistent. We pursue our comfort more than God's kingdom. We use our resources on ourselves more than the other. But you know what? When your master sees you, he sees a masterpiece. He sees Christ in you, his life, his faithfulness. And he sees your faithfulness as an expression of your love for him. So for those of you who are actively serving your church and serving your community, I want to encourage you. You might not get thanked uh, in person for preparing for CG or Central Youth regularly every week. You may not get praise for the friendships you're building with non-believers. You might not see immediate results for your fight for justice or mercy. But God sees you. For others of you, Maybe you care more about your own concerns, your own comforts, your own accomplishments, and you're not doing much for Christ. I want to urge you, be faithful to Christ. Serve at church. Help out at a homeless shelter. Care about justice and mercy. And do this because God sees you. And when he sees you, he sees a perfect masterpiece. And he couldn't be more proud, and his heart couldn't be more filled with joy and love for you. Christ Central, our Savior cannot wait to come back and finally see you. So late, let's wait for him well by being faithful to him. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, uh, we want to faithfully work for you because you first faithfully worked for us, even unto your death. And you did it so that we can now have life and share in your joy. So knowing that you're coming back soon, help us to fight our love for comfort and faithfully work for you. Because there's no greater purpose, there's no greater person to live for than you. So anywhere we see the curse of sin, help us to run there and work and love and use our gifts for our good and your glory. Amen. For those of us here, why don't we stand together and let's respond to the word that we just heard. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Sing Jesus the name above every name. Jesus the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside.
Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. to receive the benediction of the God who loves you and who faithfully worked for you to the very giving of his life for your benefit, for your salvation. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank